We are in Acts chapter 18. We're continuing on. We're come to a actually a break in the scene. Uh, we've had uh, uh, Paul in Corinth and all the events that are in Corinth, and he remains in Corinth for a while. And as I have already made mention, that uh, as I study for this class, I just find new things, things that I forgot to put in, or things that uh, uh, I wasn't sure that anyone was actually sure about, and then go and try to discover, can we know certain things? And uh, in his time in Corinth, it is very possible, because he's in Corinth for at least a year and six months, and probably more than a year and six months, uh, because it mentions, it, it gives an unspecified time period uh, that uh, he remained a good while. That's verse 18. He's talking about, it's talking about uh, while he's in Corinth, after it mentions a year and six months. So he's, he's there a year and six months, at least, we would just say at least, and we know that number. Uh, he could very well have, while he was in Corinth, written the books of First and Second Thessalonians, letters going to the, to the church in Thessalonica, which he would have visited in chapter 17. In chapter 17, that's the first city he visits. And now that he's in Corinth, he may very well be writing from Corinth to Thessalonica. And that would be, if this is true, could very well be the first books he writes. Now understand, the order that we have concerning just uh, what Paul writes. He's, uh, the first book we have that Paul writes is the book of Romans. But Romans is written considerably later than other books, and we can know it. We can know that. Uh, and uh, the, uh, but one of the clues in this, that, and, and it's very, very difficult to give a solid chronological order to his books. That's, it's very difficult to do. Matter of fact, nobody can really do it, give you a chronology of it. But one of the clues, anyway, is uh, in 18, Acts 18 and 5, we have Silas and Timothy arriving in Corinth. Okay? And in 1 Thessalonians 1 1, and also 2 Thessalonians 1 1, he says that he's with Silvanus and Timothy. And it is while I said that uh, Silas, this is the last mention that we have of Silas, if Silvanus is another form of his name, then this is the next mention of, of him. And yeah, it probably is. Silvanus is probably another form of, of Silas. And uh, that this is the only place where... Uh, it, after we have him in Thessalonica, this is the only place where we have Timothy and Silas together with Paul. And so it is possible that while at Corinth, he was corresponding to the church at Thessalonica. Now, when he gets to Ephesus and in chapter 19, now we've already seen where he passed through Ephesus and he doesn't stay. He passed through, taught at a synagogue, and he's on his way to Jerusalem. And we talked about that last week, on his way to Jerusalem. Um, uh, uh, but he's coming back. He's coming back in chapter 19, and there's going to be more that's going to be happening in Ephesus. Okay, And uh, at Ephesus, it is a very plausible, that, or very possible, that... Paul writes 1st and 2nd Corinthians from Ephesus. And uh, there's a point in time when we're going to, in this class, we're in, and I'm beginning it now, uh, trying to look at when each book might have been written, if we know, and try to give a placement, if we know, 
Uh, and there are other things that we're going to need to do now that we're well into this. But I didn't want to do it at the beginning. I want to do it fairly toward, you know, getting, getting to this point or, or further down the line. And in talking about, uh, soon we're going to talk about Paul's character. We're going to talk about that. Uh, we didn't really cover a lot of that at the beginning. We talked about his background. Uh, but we're going to need to talk about his character coming up very soon. And uh, the things that we see from the book of Acts, but also the things that he says about himself. And, and also what his enemies say about him. Um, and how he, he responds to that. But, all right, there's, uh, before we get on to uh, verse 24, I do want to make mention, let's go to, to so we're Acts 18, verse 22, because there's something that occurred to me and I did more research. We talked about 18.22 and the options in this. And uh, that he says, well, really we need to go to verse 21. But took a leave of them saying, now they want him, you have the, the Jews and those in the synagogue want him to stay longer. But he took leave of them saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you, God willing, and he sailed from Ephesus. Okay, now we do know he returned. We do know that. Now, we spoke last week of him saying that he wanted to go to Jerusalem and that the Nestle Allen text, which is a rather old text, does not, but it, it actually that text had not been discovered after the, the King James was translated. It was after the King James translated, matter of fact, considerably later, after the King James was translated, that the Nestle Allen text was discovered. And in the Nestle Allen text, it does not include this statement that he was going to keep the feast in Jerusalem, this coming feast. Okay, and we talked about the different possibilities. Uh, but there was something that took, suddenly it, it just occurred to me from verse 22. And when he had landed at, at Caesarea and gone up and greeted the church, he went down to Antioch. And it was that word down that... I knew it was there, but I hadn't real, realized what it meant. As we have often said, when, some, when in the, the New Testament, or even in the Old Testament, when something says we went up to such and such a place, or we went down to such and such a place, that is a change in elevation. It's not going north or south as we refer to it because we, we align our maps up with north is always at the top. So if, if we say, you know, we're going up to, typically what we mean is it's north of us. Or if we're going down, typically we, I'm going down to Florida. That means it's south of us. But in the New Testament, in the first century, what that meant is you're going up in altitude or you're going down in altitude. And... It, it, it occurred to me that Caesarea, being so close to the coast, is probably not very high in altitude. And that uh, Antioch also is close to the coast, and that, but it might be higher. I doubt that if it's any lower, that it would be almost imperceptible. But I went and did a little bit more investigating on this, and there are some that say, while Jerusalem is not there in that particular point, or this particular verse, that we should have understood he's going to Jerusalem. He did go to Jerusalem. He greeted the brethren, and then he went down from Jerusalem to Antioch. That is a distinct possibility. Because... It always states when someone is in Jerusalem, Jerusalem is up on a mountain. And you go, you go down to uh, Galilee. Uh, you go down to Jericho from, from Jerusalem uh, because you're going down mountainside. And uh, last week we gave the possibility that, that Luke just didn't put Jerusalem in there. 
uh, because he's been known to, and it's the Holy Spirit, been known to, to, uh, to leave out certain things because they're not terribly vital. They're not vital at all. But being that he says he's going to go in the other, other verse, in just verse 21, and being that he goes to Caesarea, which we said last week, why would he be going to Caesarea? Because Caesarea is too far south. Uh, he would ha then have to go back up north to Antioch. You would go to Caesarea to go to Jerusalem. That would be your port th that you would, you would go there in order to go to Jerusalem. Yes, ma'am. There are. There's Antioch of, of um, Syria and Antioch of Pisidia. Yes, there are. And uh, this would be Antioch of Syria because he, and I'm going to tell you my reasoning, he's going home. Just like he and Barnabas went back to Antioch of Syria, this is him coming back to Antioch of Syria. And, uh, and this going down would also be an indication that this was by land, not by sea. And uh, because uh, it, it never says you went down somewhere when uh, they sailed. Okay. Uh, but uh, having tried to give another explanation, another option in this, we continue on. Because it's very possible, that, and we mentioned it last week, very possible that he went to Jerusalem. And we already made mention that in Acts chapter 9, there are three years not even mentioned in Paul's life in Acts chapter 9, because it doesn't have to be. He's going to cover it in, in the book of Galatians. He's going to make mention of it in Galatians, that they're the leaving Damascus in Acts chapter 9, uh, he doesn't go directly to Jerusalem. He's three years, and part of that is... Uh, is in Arabia. He goes to Arabia, and uh, uh, which may very well have uh, uh, planted the church in Arabia. And don't think that Arabia did not have the church there. And that somehow Arabia goes from just being pagan to Muslim some 500, 600 years later, and that there, was, there were no churches in there because uh, I think it is very provable that there, well, no, actually, uh, Muhammad knew Christians, so, and he also knew Jews. And so, yeah, the church had been in Arabia uh, before Muhammad was even born. But, um, okay, so... Let's get back to Acts chapter 18, and uh, we're going now to, let's just look at verse 23. After he spent some time there, he departed and went over to the region of Galatia and Phrygia in order, strengthening all the disciples. So he is going back the same route that he did with Silas on the second missionary journey. He's doing the same route. He's doing the same thing. He, he goes back to Antioch in Syria. Then he goes up the coast um, by land back to, to Galatia and Phrygia. And Galatia would be where uh, Derby and Lystra are. And uh, now we have this break in a scene. And this is going to introduce Apollos. And Apollos is going to be mentioned here in the book of Acts, but also be mentioned in other books, other letters that Paul writes. And uh, just first one off the bat, uh, I planted, who watered? Apollos watered, but it's God that gives the increase. Okay, and here we have Apollos being uh, spoken of, and it is his introduction here. Now, a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, 
an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures came to Ephesus. Okay, so Paul has left Ephesus. He was there briefly, spoke at a synagogue, then he went on. But Apollos arrives at some point in this. And notice what it, how it describes him. One, he's a Jew. Number two, he's born in Alexandria. That's Alexandria. What, co what country is that in? Egypt. Egypt. He's from Alexandria, Egypt. And Alexandria is a highly, it, it's highly esteemed in the first century Mediterranean world as a center of learning. It would be very much a rival or an envy of Athens. Alexandria was an extraordinary place. And it is a, well, it's just one of those things I wish that hadn't happened, and that is the Library of Alexandria burned. And there were no telling what was in that library. No telling what. But at this point in time, uh, it, it's there. But here you have this man from Alexandria, and it says that he is eloquent. So he is extremely well-spoken. And uh, Paul, as we made mention last week, Paul does not describe himself, nor do others describe Paul as eloquent. He speaks the truth, and as we said, that's enough. Does it matter if someone speaks the truth and they have a stutter? Does it really matter? No, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. If they're speaking the truth, if you have a, a doctor who is diagnosing something very vital to your health and he stutters, do you just say, no, he stutters. I'm not going to listen to a single word he said. Well, it'd be foolish. It would be foolish. It, you'd, you'd want to know exactly what he said and take that into deep consideration. All right? Uh, but it not, we're not saying that, that Paul stuttered. But he did not have the eloquence that someone else could have had, such as Apollos could have had. And yeah, I've, I can uh, name you some preachers who I consider them very good, but not eloquent. They speak just plain and simple, and that's enough. But I also know some others that they would be in that Apollos category of where they're incredibly eloquent. They're just pouring out words that, wow, I would have never thought of using that word at this moment, but that fits. And I cannot predict where his sentences are going. And there's all these things that are just pouring out. And it is, I mean, as far as the artistry of it, it is beautiful. It's beautiful. But you don't need that. You don't need that. But he's got it. He has it. And I have no doubt in my mind that if Apollos had been asked by the Stoics and the Epicurean philosophers in Athens, they may have had more of a general respect for him to begin with, not that they would have obeyed because of his eloquence or because he was from Alexandria, uh, doesn't, because it's the same word, but I don't think they necessarily would have called him a babbler or a seed picker. Maybe they would have, but he's from Alexandria. That would hold some credit to them. Ju uh, Jerusalem, no credit whatsoever. And the fact that he could t have their language, he, um, Greek, not Hebrew, but Greek, and be so incredibly eloquent with it, they would have respected that. They would have respected that. But once again, one does, if one is converted because of eloquence, they're, on, they're converted over something extremely shallow. All right, you've got to be converted over the word of Christ and to Christ, not to someone's ability to spill out words in a beautiful way. All right. And he, okay, so he's a Jew. He's born in Alexandria. Alexandria. He's eloquent and he's mighty in the scriptures. So 
this is uh, showing that Apollos knows his scripture. But we're going to find out that he's limited. He has a limited knowledge. What scripture has been written. Now understand at this time, at this time, what New Testament books have been written? I can't answer that. He is a Christian. He is a Christian. Uh, and he is uh, he's preaching soundly up to a point. And he comes to Ephesus. But here's the limitation. Verse 25. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord. So he's been instructed of certain things and being fervent in spirit. So he's a Christian. He has faith. He spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he has everything else right, evidently, but he only knew the baptism of John. Does that bring about a limitation? Yes, it does. Is it possible, and I will say yes, it, it is very possible, it's highly possible, that, um, that Apollos was baptized by John or someone in that day before the crucifixion of Christ? Yes. Yes. That he could not have learned what he knew after Acts chapter 2 because they would be teaching something they would not be teaching the baptism of John at that point so it's possible that he was at Jerusalem or in in that region and he heard concerning the Jesus of Nazareth and he may have heard John the Baptist he may have heard that and he's obviously baptized in the baptism of John Obviously, because we're going to find that uh, the baptism of John is out of time at this point. It is valid at a certain point, very valid, until we get to the cross and then to Pentecost, because the baptism of John, we need to understand this, baptism, baptism of John was for the remission of sins. John said it, and Jesus said it. Okay? They're both preaching the same baptism for the remission of sins. They are both saying that. They are both saying, be bapti repent and be baptized. And also, for the remission of sins, they are saying that. And for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This was preparing a people for Acts chapter 2 when the church would come into being. That the church would not begin with zero. All right, I know preachers who say it was at zero. I do not believe that at all. I, what was the point of John's baptism and Jesus' baptism before the crucifixion? Because Jesus is teaching the same thing that John was. Now, Jesus is not baptizing anybody, and I think there's a very good reason for that. Others are doing it. His apostles are doing it. Disciples are doing it. I think that if Jesus were doing it, okay, I'm baptized by Jesus, it's, it's a pity you weren't. Okay, my salvation, sure. Yours is a little bit shaky, but mine is sure. Okay, it, it is a, a very good reason why he did not. But in this, Apollos knew the ways of the Lord. He knew Jesus is the Christ. He knew that. But he did not know what occurred thereafter concerning baptism. But he's, he's fir firm in spirit. He's very fervent in, in all of this. He knows the scriptures he knows. He's mighty in them. Now, here is a lesson that someone can have all these things. He's got the talent. He's got the willingness. He has the faith. He has the fervor. 
but there's something he doesn't know just yet. And it does have, it does bear a consequence. Okay, because he knew only the baptism of John. Now, the baptism of John, let's just explain it very briefly. Further, I should say, it was to prepare a people going into the church, into Acts chapter 2. They were already in the church. And, and Acts chapter 2, we have, to ju- we have to say this because I've heard the argument, and I'm going to tell you the argument doesn't work. Okay, Verse 47, Acts chapter 2, verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church those who were being saved. Okay, and I've heard the argument that you can add to zero. Well, when is the church called zero? Added to the church, so the church, you, you don't add to a church that's zero. You can't. It couldn't be called the church if no one's there. You can't call it the church added to the church those who were being saved. Someone had to be there. Now, what, was there any other purpose to the baptism of John? Yes, the purpose was to, I, we already made mention, prepare people for the church, but also that to, it was done in pointing out that Jesus is the Christ and the coming kingdom. Okay, now what happens after the Christ has done his duty, which takes him to the cross and has ascended into heaven and is crowned king? There's a kingdom. What happens when you have the kingdom that is ruled from heaven now on the earth? Acts chapter 2. What happens then? That baptism is no longer valid. That baptism, while it's for remission of sins, was looking forward to the church, looking forward to the kingdom. What happens when the kingdom is here? You don't have that baptism looking forward to the kingdom or looking forward to the Christ doing His duty. That's been done. It's now under the authority of the entire Godhead it, it is for the remission of sins, so in that respect, it's very, very similar. But you are raised to newness of life. You are brought into His church. Now, back before the church, you weren't brought into His church until there was the church. Okay, so it matters. It matters. And if I were preaching, uh, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and what's wrong with the, with the idea of repentance? Nothing. What's wrong with the rest of it? Kingdom of Heaven is here. Okay? Kingdom of Heaven is here. And saying it's at hand is a bit out of date. You need a little more learning. Now, does it have ramifications? Yes, it does. When we get into chapter 19, we'll see that. But now we see two people we've already been introduced to. Two people who are very gentle in this. They don't lamb blast him. They don't make this a public spectacle because they're going to respect what he's doing. And here is a conscientious man, or at least it would appear that he is that way. You don't want to embarrass him whatsoever, but he does need to be taught. So, uh, Verse 26, so he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Okay, now he's speaking boldly in the synagogue. That's where Paul had been. It's it's that synagogue in Ephesus. Paul had been there. How many days before? We, We don't know. But it would be a matter of, of days rather than weeks, or a matter of weeks rather than months, but it wouldn't have been too much longer till uh, uh, Apollos shows up. And he, uh, he speaks boldly in the synagogue. Aquila and Priscilla are still there. Okay. Now, here we made mention of Aquila and Priscilla, that's from verse 2, being introduced. 
And we know they're Jewish. We know they came from Rome because Claudius tossed all the, the uh, Jews out of Rome. So they had to go somewhere, so they went to Corinth. And they follow, they follow uh, 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 Paul. They're going to follow Paul to Ephesus. Okay, now, are they traveling with Paul. Now, were they members of the church in 18 verse 2? We don't know. But by 18 verse 26, they know too much to say they're not members of the church. And they care too much to say they're not members of the church. Why would they care to correct him if they had not been obedient to the gospel and they knew what the baptism was? Because it is a subtlety, I have to say. There's a subtlety involved in this. And yeah, we have some, uh, some who, who don't quite understand it. Uh, and under the, the idea, and it is an, the idea, that you know, this doesn't affect us anyway because we are way beyond the, the teaching of John and, and the cross and the church, the beginning of the church. Okay, we're way beyond that. Yes, ma'am. And Apollos didn't push back with this. No, that is, a good, that is a good point. Apollos does not push back. That was the comment. That is correct. Let's, let's look here. So, so uh, when Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. So they take him aside to teach him. And here they are in a synagogue, all right? The last thing those people in the synagogue need is a bickering between these people over baptism. That's the last thing they need. Of, and I know that if I were seated there listening to, okay, so I've heard Paul. I heard Paul, you know, a, a few weeks ago. Now here comes Apollos. Paul is a Jewish man. Uh, we know he's from Tarsus. Okay, that's great. Now comes uh, Apollos. He's from, he's from Alexandria. That, that's great. And both of them are telling me something and now we have Priscilla and Aquila, Jews that have come from Corinth. Before that, they, they were from Rome. Okay, that's great. And they're bickering over this? I, my thing is, all right, this is, this is too confusing. Uh, I'm not sure that I want to have anything to do with this. Uh, this, is, this is just too confusing for me. They take him aside and they speak to him the ways of the Lord more accurately. And notice the way of God more accurately. That the way of God included baptism as it currently, in its current form, which it'll never change again. One was to prepare people, and it was for salvation, to, and to usher them into the church. But today, you are baptized into His body. All right, that, that couldn't be said prior to the crucifixion. It couldn't be said because His kingdom wasn't here. His kingdom wasn't here. Afterwards, Acts chapter 2, which is only 10 days after He ascends into heaven and is crowned king, then uh, you have all of them are brought right into the kingdom, just, just switching right into the kingdom because it's been established. And... The way of God more accurately means including the teaching of baptism and getting it accurate. That you cannot be, you cannot have proper baptism. And this is a major point. You cannot have someone properly baptized if they think they're being baptized into something else. Their knowledge is wrong. Therefore, their faith is wrong. Therefore, it cannot be counted as, and I would not take this risk, cannot be counted as valid because of what occurs in just a few more verses. It cannot be in the fact that they are correcting him. Verse 27. Yes, Priscilla can, is, she is teaching him with Aquila. Yet, yeah, so the question is, can Priscilla actually take part 
in explaining this to the man Apollos. Well, clearly, Aquila and Priscilla heard him. They took him aside and, and explained to him the way, more accurate, the way of God more accurately. So they heard it. They took him. They explained. It doesn't say that she did all of this. They did it together. But being that this is... Does a, and we come to this, does a woman have a right to teach a man the gospel? And my answer to that is, a woman who is living her life as the gospel describes it is going to be teaching everybody. Okay? And usurping nobody's authority. Because that is, uh, that is also the gospel. All right? She will be teaching everybody. Everybody, she's going to be teaching even without a word. She can teach her husband even without a word because of her behavior. She can do that. Now, can on just a one-on-one -on -one basis, because this isn't one-on-one, -on -one, this is two-on-one, but on a one-on-one -on -one basis, can a woman just teach a man? Yes, she can. She is obligated to. She can write him a letter. She can write a book. She can write a song, she can write a poem, or she can just speak to him. She can do a bulletin board, she can have something that's been recorded and he happens to listen to it, or like we said, an article and he happens to read it. There is nothing wrong with that, but usurping authority in worship is a different matter and nobody has that. Nobody is to be doing that. Okay, nobody has the right to usurp authority in, uh, in, uh, in a, a, a Bible class setting or in, um, in worship. All right, you don't, you don't have that. And uh, like we're doing now, uh, y'all have every right to ask questions and to make comments. But are you usurping my authority? No, not at all. Not in the least. And the fact of the matter is that if I went to your house and was doing a Bible study with you as the homeowner, who has the authority there? Who can tell me to get out of the house? I mean, you, you do. You have that right. Every lady has a right to tell somebody to get out of their house. Unless it's the police and they have a warrant. Oh yeah, that's a different matter. But and hopefully that never happens. But... Uh, uh, you have every right to do that. And she, here we have the example of Priscilla with her husband going to this man who is eloquent, mighty in scriptures. He's Jewish, man's a man, and they are teaching him. Now, let's get, do verse uh, 27. And uh, continuing in that. And when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who believed through grace. So he's leaving uh, Ephesus. Ephesus is in Asia, not far from the coast, but it's, a, it's not on the coast. And he's going to Achaia. Achaia is where uh, Corinth is. That's where Achaia is. Uh, that's the region Corinth is, is there. And I do believe Athens is part of Achaia. Uh, for he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. So going to Achaia, he continues in all this. Now, it says, verse uh, uh, 25 I'm sorry, 26, that he spoke boldly in the synagogue. Now verse 28, he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly. And he's showing that Jesus, from scriptures, Jesus is the Christ. And how do you do that? You do that by showing the scriptures, starting with Moses and working your way through. And that would include David. That would include everyone that the Jews would recognize as being valid. 
they would recognize Moses as being, being valid. They'd recognize David as being a prophet. They would recognize Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Joel and Daniel and and they would they'd recognize all of them and every single one of them spoke of the Christ every one of them and more and more so now he's able to do it now we are coming to chapter 19 we're going to begin this actually this we're starting something uh, new in this because I'm going to take a I'm going to take a little bit of a break from the book of Acts and uh, just uh, we're, we're going to uh, next week we're just going to call it a, for a day for today uh, but uh, next week we're going to start something new we're going to get back to 19 because we need to because that that connects up we're back to Paul and what he finds in Ephesus but next week I want to go through some things we haven't discussed yet and it concerns Paul's character and we're all well we've already made mention that in going into Ephesus he is very likely writing the books the letters of first Corinthians and second Corinthians and probably uh, the correspondence is there because uh, in 1 Corinthians, he does make mention that they have been corresponding. He and the, the church at Corinth, they have been corresponding. But obviously, those are not inspired or we don't need them. Okay, it could be that they were inspired, but we don't need them. Whatever was in them, we don't need them. 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, we do need those but that earlier correspondence, we don't need, and I would enjoy having it, there's no doubt about it, we don't need every correspondence that Paul ever gave. We don't need that. And, um, but 1 Corinthians deals with the problems that they were already having. And in thinking about it, that the church would be extremely young, that congregation would be extremely young in Corinth, and... Uh, they're going off the rails. And um, so uh, we will uh, uh, continue next week. I appreciate everybody being with us. We will, uh, as I said, next week begin in the discussion of Paul's character, not at his background, we've already done that, but his character, and we can see how he, uh, uh, how he deals with brethren and with his enemies. And uh, thank you, everybody, and hopefully next week we can continue.